this piss me off. I am lying in bed, about to fall asleep, minding my own business, loving husband. Lisa actually had the nerve to tell me that she would rather have me go blind, yeah, than have her brother die. <laughs> Okay, okay, maybe it was a stupid question. <laughs> Everybody in this room knows a couple that shouldn't be together. They just argue constantly. By the way, if you don't know that couple, you are that couple. <laughs> I believe that the primary motivating factor in all of life is inertia. It is extremely difficult to stop moving in the direction you're headed. I mean, how many people here have a job? You never thought this would be your career. You were just going to do it for a while, and then slowly it's what you became. You can do that very easily with relationships as well. Do you think you've met the perfect person for you in life? No way. You met a person at a place that you happen to be at the same time and you ask them out and you had sex and you fell in love and you live together now if it works good if it doesn't it ruins your life don't you know people they wake up every day married to the worst roommate of all time somebody who's ruining their life and i know that counseling can be effective sometimes yes but you know what's always effective divorce <laughs> divorce is like ripping a, a band-aid off a really hairy part of your body just yank it, just yank it once, scream, and go on with your lungs. It's better than pulling a hair a day for the rest of your life. <laughs> to me, the ironic thing about divorce in our society is that compared to the marriage, it's a small thing. Well, they're of equal import. They should be equal. There should be a divorce ceremony of some sort paid for by the husband's parents. That's only fair. <laughs> fair they would send out the invitations mr. and mrs. Jack Reynolds are embarrassed to announce the divorce of their idiot son Rick from that bitch Lisa something like that you'd go back to the exact same church walk backwards down the aisle you'd pull off the ring give it to the worst man you'd have your maids of dishonor sluts in black over there Make it more embarrassing is my point. Now, I know people that fight over the stupidest things. Well, one thing, I do not understand jealousy over your partner's sexual past. What does that have to do with you? I know that my wife, Lisa, had sex before she met me, okay? I can handle that. Of course, she didn't enjoy it. <laughs> really don't think so. I am 40 years old. I've had sex with 23 women in my life. Now, some of you are thinking, wow. Others are thinking, geez, what a wiener. <laughs> 23 women. I've had crabs twice, which is not a bad woman to crab ratio. <laughs> go with those figures. <laughs> you know, one of the things we do talk about a lot at our house when friends come over, sex. It's a neat subject. I'm always amused to discover that all women think they know how horny men are. You're not even close. <laughs> I would have had sex with as many women as I could have in my life if I could have, if they would have let me. I did not have the pre prerequisites of catching women. I was not cool and I was not handsome. I know I'm not an ugly person. I'm not going to kiss you and have you vomit all over the place. <laughs> I could have been good looking though. You know, good looks was ripped from me. It pisses me off. When I was in the second grade, I could not see the blackboard. So I had to get these, the ugliest, geekiest glasses known to man. And I had these glasses until high school when I got contacts, but I also got acne, really bad acne in high school. And I had horrible acne for years. As my acne started to go away, so did my hair. <laughs> I never had one good year. When I started losing my hair, unbelievable. Uh, you, did it bother you when you started losing your hair? No lying bastard, of course it did! It's the worst, I'm looking in the mirror, I'm losing my hair, I can't stand it. 
So I started getting my transplants. My hair now grows on top of my head in rows like a field of corn. I'm not losing my hair. It's being picked clean by crows at this point. I just got my hair transplants, my first hair transplants, when I met Lisa. Oh, God, she was so cute. She was so young, 21, I can't believe. She's waitressing at this comedy club, right? And I work up my nerve, and I, I ask her out, and I have my plug, so I was so worried. I was actually talking to her, kind of like this, kind of leaning back. <laughs> I fell in love with Lisa in, um, I'd say, about two weeks. She fell in love with me in about six months. And uh, we got married six months after that and moved to Los Angeles. That's where you go if you want to be famous, right? Lisa hates L.A. because she's normal. <laughs> but we lived there for five years because, damn it, I just wanted fame. What eventually drove me out of Los Angeles was the entertainment industry. I don't want to say anything bad about the entertainment industry, but it is an ugly cancer that can consume you. <laughs> and it certainly did me. God, I remember it was like three years ago. Three years ago, I sat down at 1.15 in the morning to watch one of my best friends, Jake, do his debut on The Letterman Show. I would have never admitted to myself that I wanted Jake to do badly. But that's what I wanted. And he came out on that stage and killed like I've seen nobody kill before or since. And I went to bed massively depressed. And I woke up the next day and I asked myself, what kind of a world is it you live in where your friend's successes are somehow your failures? Well, it's a really sick world, isn't it? And it's one of many reasons that I moved. And we bought this house in Petaluma. I can't get over how much I love my house. I also can't get over how much my wife, Lisa, loves the garden in our backyard. It's dirt and shit that will be dead soon. <laughs> and she's consumed with the thing. I'm always hurting her feelings. We'll be sitting around the supper table and Lisa will say, Ricky, how's that tomato? And I kind of look up and go, hey, save this a quarter. Good deal. And I go back. <laughs> About two years ago, I finally got the zen of Lisa's garden. I was sitting one night watching TV, my big screen TV, eating my mystic mints, which I love. And generally, when I eat cookies, I try to save the last one for special. So this one night, I went to reach for the last cookie. And it was gone. And to show you what a wretched husband I am, my first thought was that Lisa took the last cookie. And then I remembered, God damn it. I had eaten the last cookie without even realizing it was the last cookie, so I never got that last cookie enjoyment. And that's when I began to formulate my very simplistic, really gooberistic philosophy of life. You should eat every cookie as though it were the last cookie. <laughs> and when I thought that simplistic thing, I got a lot more than Lisa's garden. I finally got Lisa. What Lisa has done is what you have to do to be happy. She's taken an insignificant thing on this planet and made it a big deal in her life. That is something I had never done. In fact, I don't even think, in a sense, I lived my life. I observed it. I was always doing this pseudo-intellectual thing where I was going to piece together the tapestry of my life. Well, that's bullshit. There is no tapestry of my life. All that ever exists at any point are the moments that weave my tapestry. And the more I live in my moments, trust me, the happier I become. I'll give you a good example of this. You know those few extra minutes of sleep you give yourself in the morning? Those few toasty, luxurious minutes are worth more than your entire eight hours of sleep, really, because you're so riveted by them. Don't you lay there in the morning going, 10 more minutes. Oh, God, I'm happy. 10 minutes, I can't believe it. 10 minutes, it's a long time. Oh, God. Nine minutes, all good, nine. You take those 10 minutes, you stretch them into an hour by paying attention to them. You know, look at this year. Look how much of this year has gone by already. And we just had a New Year's, didn't we, recently? And they always say this, the older you get, the faster time goes by. Well, it's obvious why that is. Because the stimuli in your life diminishes. You've seen it all before. You're doing shit you do over and over again. 
That's why you have to step outside and go, hey, this is a great thing in my life. And while I have your attention, let me ask you this question. I love this question. Somebody hands you a magic coin and you flip it. If it lands heads, you'll get everything in life you've ever wanted. You'll be rich, you'll be famous, play the piano, anything. If it lands tails, you die. You instantly and painlessly pass from existence. And the question is simple. Would you take that chance with your life? Would you flip that coin? I think that if you would, if you deep down in your heart think you would flip the coin, you got big problems. <laughs> The only life you will ever have is not enough for you. Nothing could be more tragic than that. And I should know, because it was my lot for 37 years. I would have flipped the coin like that for the first 37 years of my life because I didn't like what I had. And three years ago, I made a very conscious decision to not flip the coin. I said to myself, I am not going to be the things I thought I would be. I'm not going to wait until they happen. I'm not going to cure AIDS. I'm not going to win a Nobel Peace Prize. This is what I have. It had better be enough. And we moved to Petaluma, and a week went by, and a month went by, an entire year went by in which I was not suicidally depressed. I like that. <laughs> you know, I used to play this game in college all the time. I would turn off the pilot light on my stove, and I'd turn on all the gas, and I'd lie down on my bed. I would not permit myself to get up until I could think of one good reason to go on living. If I did this today, I'd just say fudge and get back up, right? <laughs> well, this is college, and I'm, I'm sophomoric and naive, and one night, I couldn't think of a reason, and I fell asleep, and I fell unconscious, and hours went by. And some people smelled the gas, and they busted down the door, and they busted the window, and they're pumping on my chest. And as I came out of the thing choking and hacking, the first thing I felt was embarrassment, because, you know, this looks bad. <laughs> the next thing I felt was fear, this fear I've had my entire life that I would one day turn out like my mother. Because I remember this day, years before this, when I walked into the Gresham Hospital lobby to pick Mama. And she's sitting in this corner, very pale. She's reading a Life magazine. And I walked right up to her and I said, Mom, you ready to go? Mom? Mom, are you ready? She puts down her magazine and she looks right at me. And I can tell she has no idea who I am. And the receptionist saw this happen and she called me over. Excuse me, Mr. Reynolds? Mr. Reynolds, I think you're supposed to talk to the doctor before you take your mom home. So I went into this doctor's office and this bearded doctor proceeded to tell me about electroshock therapy, about how it was painless, how bits and pieces of mom's memory would come back that night or that year, and other memories somehow would be erased forever. And I used to try really hard on the nights of mom's shock treatments to convince her that she had borrowed money from me. <laughs> I know that sounds horribly mean. This would have been much meaner to do years before, because years before, we didn't have any money. We were very poor. Welfare and food stamps, all of that. But when this happened, when I was 16 years old, things were going pretty well because after all of the crap that my mom had lived through, she had finally met a decent man. His name was Don. Donald Chase, dad number three.